All right. Let's take out our Bibles and turn to John, John's Gospel. Chapter (laughs) 2. Yes, you didn't think I could get here. All right, this morning we're entering a a new phase of the gospel and the way it's structured and um, this section is the beginning of signs. Signs as in S-I-G-N, right? There are seven signs in the gospel of John. Key moments or events, miracles actually that unmistakably reveal the divine glory of Jesus. So John doesn't use the word miracle. He uses the word signs. Paul uses the word miracle. But John uses the word signs to talk about extraordinary um, miraculous events. But he calls them signs because they're pointing to Christ. They're pointing to his glory. So up until now, John has been building his case for you putting your faith in Jesus by declarations and statements that people make. So we saw them in the prologue first and then in the statement of John the Baptist and then the disciples assertions, statements, truths, claims, statements of fact. And these assertions just flat out tell us who Jesus is. So it's not like a mystery. He wants you to know all that up front. And we saw in the prologue um, uh, from the statement of John himself, it being the author of the gospel, in verse 17 of chapter 1, it says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who was in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So there's a lot there about who Jesus is. He's the only begotten, he's God, he he came from the Father, Um, he's full of grace and truth, Uh, that's what he brought to us. John chapter 1 verse 29, John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's probably the most important statement in the whole gospel here. John chapter 1 verse 49, Nathanael says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. So all of these things he said just in the first chapter here, statements, conclusions, facts, things to, important information. But signs are actions that demonstrate who Jesus is, God in human flesh. So John records seven signs. The other gospels have way more miracle stories, but John is super narrowly focused, seven carefully selected signs, um, because he wants to use these to reveal certain things about Jesus and along with most of these signs come a lot of dialogue as well. That'll be a little bit later in the gospel. So he does this from chapter 2 all the way to chapter 11. So today we're coming to chapter 2 and like kind of like Jesus first meeting with Peter and then Nathaniel in chapter 1. The story we're going to look at today is what you would call bare bones. I mean it's just a few simple expressions, sentences, interactions and then it's it's over because John wants to talk about signs. He doesn't want to give a whole explanation for what happened on this particular day. So, and this is the first sign we're going to talk about. um, What John calls the beginning of signs. So this is the first miracle of Jesus. So remember we're in the very first days of Jesus' official ministry, his public ministry. He has spent 30 plus years living his life the way any human being would, right? So um, he wasn't sitting in a cave. He wasn't on top of a mountain waiting for people to come up to him for wisdom. He wasn't in some religious order, a a monk somewhere off in the desert or anything like that. He grew up in a normal Jewish family. Four brothers and a bunch of sisters and a mom and a dad who seems to have passed away by this time. But um, working hard, he worked, his father taught him his carpentry business, construction. Probably worked in the city of Zephorus, which was about a 40 minute walk from Nazareth and helped build this great Roman city in the middle of Israel. And that's what Jesus did for the for the whole first years of his life. A working class guy uh, working construction and fulfilling his obligations as a faithful Jew. All that changed when the Lord told Jesus now is the time to begin your work and to present yourself publicly. The true purpose for which he came is about to be revealed. It's important that Jesus lived a normal life because he was a man like us and those things. But his ministry begins with his baptism. 
under the ministry of the first prophet in 400 years, John the Baptist, the man whose job it was to prepare the way for the Messiah. So the first thing that started all this was his baptism. And when John baptized Jesus, he said he saw the Spirit of God descending from heaven and remaining on him. And John said that God told him that would be the sign that this is the, this is the Messiah. So that's what happened. And Matthew tells us, of course, on that occasion, there was a voice out of heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then, immediately after that, he is driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit for 40 days. And he fasted there in this barren place for 40 days alone. Except for the only person he had for company was the devil. Right? So Satan tempted him during those 40 days. He was tempted and tested and proved worthy. He conquered temptation. He beat it. He did not fall. Unlike Adam and Eve who in a beautiful luscious garden with everything they could ever want fell immediately. (laughs) Jesus tested in a totally barren place starving to death for 40 days passed the test. So a much worthy man right? Right there. So at the end of that trial he comes back to John the Baptist and that's where John points to him and tells his other disciples behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what immediately happened after that. He came back to John. Okay. While with John the Baptist Jesus began to collect some of his disciples John's disciples and bring them into his sphere because he needed reliable men to start proclaiming the kingdom of God with him and he had to train them for a lifetime of service to him. So last time at the end of chapter 1 we ended with Nathaniel being blown away because Jesus knew what he was doing before he came to see him. Miraculous knowledge in some way, right? So Nathaniel very subtly says, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And Jesus promised Nathaniel, he said, he was kind of like, you think that's something? (laughs) He said, greater works than these will you see. Greater things you'll see. So we come to chapter 2, just a few days after that. So all of this is happening within a week, basically. Um, Just a few days after that, we're going to have the first sign. So remarkably the first sign takes place at a wedding. So chapter 2 verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Cana is about nine miles north of Nazareth. Not too far from there. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So let me just kind of review our timeline here real real quick here. Just kind of walk through that again. So time wise the narrative portion of John's gospel which starts in chapter 1 verse 19 prologue up to then then verse 19 the narrative part the story it begins with John the Baptist being visited by that delegation right from the religious leaders in Jerusalem they literally want to know just who do you think you are that's that was kind of their question to John the Baptist and he says he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness preparing the way for someone greater than he is that's day one Then in verse 29 of chapter 1, the next day, Jesus arrives where John is, just coming off that fast in the wilderness. And that's the day Jesus begins his ministry. And that's where John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's day 2. The next day, verse 35 of chapter 1, Jesus is introduced to Peter, Andrew's brother, and gives him a new name, Rock. That's day 3 of his public ministry. The next day, verse 43 of chapter 1, Jesus goes into Galilee and finds Philip, And Philip goes and finds Nathanael. That's day four, right? And then chapter two, verse one, it says on the third day. So three days from there, that's the end of a week. It's one full week. Day seven, the first week of Jesus' public ministry ends at a wedding. So they're invited to this wedding. And he's only had these disciples a few days. So they all got invited. So I don't know if Jesus was invited beforehand, but whatever's going on, whoever invited him said, just bring all your guys with you. Yeah, come on. So they all go to this wedding in, uh, in, in Cana. Now, so they're probably late invites. And then we learn in verse 1 of chapter 2 that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there as well. Now, I want to tell you something John does as in a literary form. Um, something he likes to do in his gospel is he, he kind of likes the idea of bookends. And by bookends, I mean like... Um, a narrative portion that has sort of a definite beginning 
and then later, later down the line, it kind of has another end, and, and it kind of makes a section there. It's like on my bookshelf at home, I've got um, General Lee on one end of my bookshelf, and General Grant on the other <laughs> bin, and, and that's kind of what John does, because he's, he's, in a story way, he's, he's using a contrasting bookend. Not all of his bookends are contrast, but this one will be an interesting contrast. I also have those two guys, uh, Isildur and Anarion, those the, the statues in Lord of the Rings, those, I've got one on one end and one on the other, uh, another shelf there. So uh, I've got, I've got, I love bookends. But he, he does it, John does this several times in the gospel and, he, and it's kind of brilliant how he does it. But in this case he's using the contrast, General Lee and General Grant, okay. Um, not literally those guys. Uh, so the first bookend is here, chapter two, verse one and two. And the bookend is the setting so his, what he's doing, he's, he's got a, a setting here, and the setting is the wedding, right? So the narrative portion of Jesus' public ministry, which starts here, um, is going to end in John chapter 11. So that's the other bookend. That's the other end of this. So we could call chapters 2 through 11, you could call it, and scholars do call it, the book of signs, because this is where the seven signs come in. So from 2 to 11, the book of signs. What's interesting about it is, Chapter 2 has the first sign and it happens at a wedding. Chapter 11 has the final sign and it happens at a funeral. So it's pretty interesting. Chapter 2 and 11 are the bookends for the book of signs, the seven signs. Chapter 2 is a joyous occasion which Jesus makes even more joyous. So it, it befits the arrival of the Messiah, the Son of God. Chapter 11 is a very sad occasion, a funeral, and Jesus weeps there, and it's befitting, because within a few days after that funeral, just a week or so away, he's going to be on a cross. So it's just interesting how John constructs his narrative that way. So in chapter two, the sign we see is, is simple, and it's a little bit hidden, actually. It's not a spectacular thing. In chapter 11, the sign is going to be the most amazing of all signs. And it's so amazing that it leads right into Palm Sunday. Why did those people welcome Jesus with palm brine? What happened? What, how did they know that was happening? Because of uh, the great miracle he did in chapter 11. So when we get there, we'll talk about that, of course. So, um, and then right after that's the Passion Week, and which in John's Gospel he takes a lot more time what's happening at the Lord's Supper than all the other Gospels. So it's, you get to chapter 11, then chapter 12, and then it's the Lord's Supper for several chapters there. So it's the way he's working this out. So chapter 2 is the first sign, chapter 11 is the last sign. If, and then when you get to chapter 12, verse 37, John says this, 1237, but though he had performed so many signs before them, they were not believing in him. So that's sort of the conclusion to the book of signs, that idea in 1237. That's where it's all going, rejection, right? So what happens at Cana is the first sign. So we're gonna look at that this morning. So remember, John tells these stories really briefly, especially this one. So we're just gonna get the highlights because his purpose is for you to understand who Jesus is so he's pointing to the sign that's where he's going so it is bare bones so we're at the wedding in Cana Mary's there Jesus is there along with his very new disciples so verse 3 when the wine ran out the mother of Jesus said to him they have no wine so we don't know anything about this wedding we don't know who's getting married we don't know what their connection is to Jesus and the family or anything like that who the couple is who Mary Mary's role there or why they ran out of wine. We don't know anything like that. Except you're supposed to plan for your wedding. <laughs> Terry Morrison would never let the wine run out at the wedding. I mean, she, you, you've got to have a good planner there. So, um, we don't know why it happened. It doesn't matter. Because that's not what the story's about. The story is about the sign. So running out of wine at a wedding. And in those days, a wedding wasn't an hour or two and then a meal. It was days. It could, if, you, if you were pretty wealthy, it, it could be a week long wedding. So everybody's coming and everybody's got to be fed and taken care of. Not for a meal, every day, all their meals, right? So it was a huge, huge thing, huge thing. So it's a huge family embarrassment, a social disaster if you run out of wine before the wedding is over and everybody's going, hey, what's going on here? So uh, it just, it's just embarrassing and it make the bride feel bad and oh, we blew it, oh, 
I'm so, so bad. Like she's crying. She's, uh, she's all upset. So that kind of thing's going on. So Mary, being the kind of godly, wonderful woman that she is, doesn't want that bride to have that experience, right? And we don't know what Mary's role here was because she's in on it when the rest of the guests don't know about it. So was she a wedding coordinator? Who knows? <laughs> what did she do in her later years? We don't know. But um, maybe she's just really close to the family, the bride's mother, and she was told, you know, we don't know. But um, we know she's been informed of this disaster and being the good woman she is, she wants to fix it for her friends, right? But getting that much wine is virtually impossible in short notice. Plus, Mary's not exactly a wealthy person, so there's not really much she can do about it, except go talk to her son. <laughs> now, look, it's embarrassing. It's not a good thing if you run out of wine at the wedding. It's kind of, it's kind of it is bad. It's kind of hurtful. The bride will be unhappy, but it, nobody's dying. This isn't like a real emergency kind of thing, right? I mean, nobody needs to be rescued from the clutches of evil. Nobody's demon possessed. Uh, nobody's on the death's door. Nothing like that's happening, but it is embarrassing. And it will take away from the joy of the occasion. So Mary can't do anything herself to solve it, but she thinks Jesus can. So it, it's, it's fair to ask the question, at this stage in Mary's life, what does she know? You know that Christmas song, Mary, did you know? <laughs> what, what does she know that can make her think Jesus can solve this problem? Um, because this is the first of signs. It's not like he's been doing signs all his life, you know. Oh, the synagogue fell down. Oh, he put it back up. No, things like that didn't happen. Um, he might have put it back up building it, <laughs> but I am just made that one up. But uh, he didn't do miracles until this day. Now, she's always known that Jesus is the kind of person that serves other people's needs above himself. She has always known that he's a resourceful person, a hardworking person. He has a good head on his shoulders. She's always known he was kind. She's always known he's righteous. She's known those things about him all his life. But based on his response to her, it seems like she's asking for a miracle. So why would she expect him to be able to do a miracle right then? It's kind of helpful just to think about that. He's never done a miracle, never in all those growing up years, all those working years. If, if the hammer fell off and he was up on the ladder, he had to go down and get it. He just didn't call it up or anything like that. So not in all the decades they were together as a family had he ever done a miracle. So what does she know? Why does she expect it now? Well, she does know that he's the Messiah. She's known that since he was born, right? Many, many decades before, when she was a young maiden, the Ab angel Gabriel came to her and told her about Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 32, he said, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. My little baby? Yes, that little baby. And at Jesus' birth, the shepherds came and they shared what the angel told them. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. In the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then Luke tells us that after the visit of the shepherds, he says, all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. So that she knew. She knew all of that. Wonderful, amazing things about Jesus. But he kept, she kept them in her heart. So then, thinking about our timeline we just walked through a bit ago, seven weeks before this wedding, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The word may have come back to her that that had happened, that Jesus was publicly baptized. He may have told her he was going to go do that. We don't know anything about that. But that's, that's, that's how far it was before the wedding when that happened. So maybe she found out. Maybe Jesus told her at the wedding. Maybe one of the disciples told her at the wedding about the baptism of Jesus. You know when you're at a wedding and you're having a good time. You're sitting at a table and you're telling what's happened. So Andrew tell me all about your life. You, you're a new friend of Jesus. Tell me about yourself. Or whatever. Those kind of things. In fact Andrew could have said to her. So you're Jesus mother. <laughs> he talks about you all the time. Listen, I was there when John the Baptist baptized Jesus and I hear that John is, it's a cousin, right? He's Jesus' cousin. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Amazing, amazing. 
Well, I was there and John said he saw the Spirit of God descend upon Jesus and rest upon him. And there was a voice from heaven that said, you're my beloved son and you I am well pleased. So if, if, if Andrew or anybody told her about that event at any time, then she knows that he's starting officially his messianic work. He's going forth now. So even if Mary hadn't heard about it before, which she probably did hear about it before the wedding, but she could have heard about it there and, and she would have that in mind and that would recall all the promises that she had heard about her son and his future. So just with that, she could well have thought that he could do something miraculous to solve the wine problem at this little wedding. So a big wedding. So she comes to him with the problem. What does she say? We only have a few words. They have no wine. <laughs> Son, they have no wine. Why are you coming to me? <laughs> so this exchange between Jesus and Mary has always fascinated me. I, I wish there was more because I'm the kind of person that just says, oh, tell me all about that. I want more details. But you're going to have to wait in line in heaven for John or Mary to get the full story about that. <laughs> But um, Jesus' response to her is not what you would expect. Verse 4, Jesus said to her, woman, stop right there. (laughs) That sounds a little condescending. Woman? That's mom. Woman? He calls her woman? Well, for one thing, woman is a direct translation of the word here. Culturally speaking, it's not the same in their culture to call a woman woman as it would be in our culture. Woman? That's not it. Um, It's not a belittling term in their culture. In fact, from the cross, Jesus calls Mary woman, right? Think of it more like ma'am. That's more what it would be, a polite term. (laughs) Ma'am. That's the closest thing I think we have to the way woman was used back then. But Jesus doesn't say mom, and he doesn't say mother. He says ma'am or something like that. And that's kind of surprising. And I've got to say, there's no record that we have in either Jewish or Roman, Greco-Roman literature where a son calls his mother woman or (laughs) ma'am. In our case, we're going to use that word ma'am. So it's a surprise. It's actually, he's actually putting a little distance between them. So he's definitely telling her something in using that word. Their relationship is not going to be what it was before. And it's much more than, you know, mom, I'm a grown man now. Don't tell me what to do. It's not that. (laughs) She she should know. Um, No, he's he's starting his great work and and things are changing. Not because of the work, but because of who he is. And she's always known who he is, but it's never come out before. She's always been her, her son up until now because that's the role he lived her son but he's begun the journey now announcing that the kingdom of God has arrived not just the kingdom of God but he is the king of that kingdom right not any king he is the king he's the lord of lords the king of kings whose kingdom will have no end that's who he is and that's what he's starting to bring to the world so Jesus is Mary's son but he's her creator and there's no other son that can say that so he's her creator, he's her king. And, that's, and now that that's, that's what's being revealed, so their relationship dynamic is going to change. So now it's ma'am. Just to put, put it in her mind that, that things are going to be a little different now. Okay. So as the word became flesh and God became man, Jesus has God as his father and everything he does from now on, and I don't know how many times in John's gospel it says it, but he's going to do God's will. He's going to do the Father's will. Everything he does is what God tells him to do. Everything he says, he says this, is what God tells him to say. So he's on the Father's timetable. Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's what he's all about now. So he's coming forward now as the Messiah, the Son of God, and that changes the dynamic. So I think that's why he says woman, And if you look again at verse 4, then Jesus says, okay, this part's difficult too. Woman, what does that have to, now my Bible says, what does that have to do with us? I have a 1995 New American Standard Bible. Yours might say something different than that. Because 
This is a really gnarly translation issue. It's actually not gnarly, but it's gnarly because modern people want to hear something and they don't like the way it actually sounds. So, <laughs> um, My Bible has even changed it. If you have a 1995 New American Standard Bible that's older than mine, it says something different because they've changed it even in this Bible, even in my Bible. This is, I have a newer edition now and they've actually changed some things and this is one of the things they changed. So mine says now, it says, woman, what does that have to do with us, right? So that's, that's saying one thing and then he says my hour has not yet come. That phrase what does it have to do with us that's a very recent way of translating that phrase. Literally it says like the King James says woman what do I have to do with you. That's literally what it says. That's what the Greek words actually say. So um, I don't know if something new has been discovered since then that makes them want to change that translation but um, the, Greek text says, the Greek text says what to me and to you. But what that means, and if you look at the Old Testament that was translated into Greek long before the New Testament was written, that always means we're not on the same page with this thing. That's what that means. What to me and what to you. That's what that phrase meant. So a good translation I think would be the King James Version. What do I have to do with you? That sounds harsh, but it's not that. It's really just stating we're not on the same page about this thing. We're not together on this. We're not in accord on this kind of things. And translations go all over the place. If you have an NIV, NIV, it says, woman, why do you involve me? Well, that's not what the word says either. It's, um, it's, so all these guys are trying to figure out how to put it in modern words. But uh, the New American Standard Version now, it sounds like they should be in accord. What does that have to do with us? But that's really not what he's saying. He's saying, what do you have to do with me? That's really what he's coming out. It sounds nicer to say it the other way, but that's Barclay, who's a New Testament scholar, he, he makes his up his own translation. He goes, he translates it this way. Let me handle this my way. <laughs> Which isn't what the words say at all, but it might be actually the idea there. Let me handle this my way. But it does seem Jesus is gently rebuking her, correcting her about his role as the Messiah and the king of the universe and all of that now. So, now the other phrase that makes this really challenging to understand from where we sit is the words that come right after that. He says, my hour has not yet come. Now that phrase is used a lot in John's gospel, but it always is referring, it seems like later in the gospel, it's always referring to his suffering, um, dying on the cross. And that's his hour when he's arrested, flogged mercilessly, beaten mercilessly and put on a cross. That's the hour when he bears the sin of the world. So it's frequently used that way. John chapter 7 verse 30 it says they were seeking to seize him and no man laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. The hour coming is when they do seize him and put their hands on him. So why would Jesus say that in this situation in the wine situation at the wedding being asked to do a miracle to bless people at a wedding and he says my hour has not yet come. So why would he say that? Nobody's waiting to take him away. He wasn't on anybody's radar yet. John the Baptist was the last guy the Pharisees were interested in. It's just a few days before that. Just a few days the religious leaders were going to John the Baptist. They weren't coming after Jesus yet. So I doubt if Jesus fears any immediate trouble here or anything like that. But probably the best way to understand it is that Mary knowing Jesus is now presenting himself to the world and he's ready to rule and reign as the Messiah, that's what she would be thinking, to be glorified in the eyes of men, he can handle absolutely anything. I think that's what she's thinking. He can handle anything, whatever he wants to do. But when she learned she would be the Messiah's mother, that would be her natural way to take that. Okay, I'm the Messiah's mother. I can ask him anything. And now that he's gone public, I can ask anything and he'll do it. Because Messiah comes with great power and righteousness. He'll bring righteousness to the whole world through his power and glory. And she says mom. But she can't be mom now. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't, you can't play that role in that way anymore. You can't, you can't decide. I have to decide. And if you read the gospels Jesus is pretty measured in the claims that he makes early on. He, a lot of stuff is by inference. Sometimes he's direct but his tendency is to reveal more and more about himself over time. He wants people to see what he's doing and what he is like and get to know him and see his power and draw conclusions and then he'll drop in hints and 
pretty clever ways to get people to think through who is this guy you know and uh, it's, it's pretty far into the ministry when he's even asking the disciples who do the people say that I am right because he's not that flat out about it um, early on when he does get explicit then people start wanting to kill him so John chapter 5 when Jesus says my father is working until now and I myself am working making himself equal with God they want to kill him chapter 7 they're trying to seize Jesus chapter 8 he's almost stoned to death by making a statement that could be interpreted quite correctly that he's claiming to be God so um, this is long before that so here he's following the father's plan he's expanding his ministry carefully to reach the entire the whole nation of Israel has to hear the good news he can't be killed yet he's got to get disciples they're going to go out two by two first to 12 and then 70 and they're going to proclaim the kingdom all through Israel that has to happen so it's unfolding over the course of time that's what's going on here so at this point his work is literally days old it's just getting started his glory is going to be revealed on his schedule so what he tells his mom is that he's got to do things now for the greater good for the work he came to do it's not up to her timetable now it's the father's timetable that he's going to be following so he's about to now he is but we'll see it in two weeks because I won't be here next week but in two weeks we'll see he's going to make a very bold move in the temple that he's going to do and that's going to cause some interesting problems for him as well but that's coming but um that's the first step that the father ordained that he goes to the temple and do that so the wedding the wine thing and the wedding thing that's not really on the plan so he's kind of telling her that get her used to that idea so um, Mary seems to understand that it's a gentle rebuke that he's making this distinction there I don't think he ever called her ma'am before but now he is so she's starting to get it and so what does she do she doesn't argue with him she submits and she says not nothing to him to the servants she turns to the servants and says do whatever he tells you and leaves it in his hands which is the right and proper thing for her to do so it's ma'am and we're not on the same page here do whatever he tells you to do (laughs) okay so she leaves it up to him Jesus decides to bless the wedding guests but without fanfare he's going to do it but it's really not going to be obvious at all that he's done it okay and that's how the story actually lays out so the miracle of course the sign is very well known who could turn water into wine right people always mock Jesus for that but that's exactly what he does and John tells it really simply verse 6 now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each and Jesus said to them fill the water pots with water so they filled them up to the brim so these pots this is just like 135 or 150 gallons like in that zone there we're talking about that's a lot that's a lot and he said to them verse 8 draw out some now and take it to the head waiter so they took it to him now my Bible calls this guy the head waiter there's a very long Greek word for what he's called and it means the ruler of the dining room I won't, I won't even try to say the word here but the translators have all kinds of different ideas for that head waiter the master of ceremonies one translation says feast master I like that one it's kind of like beast master only for people that are connoisseurs of fine wine that's a, the feast master so anyway verse 9 when the head waiter or a feast master tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it had come from but the servants who had drawn the water knew the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him every man serves good wine first and when the people have drunk freely then he serves the poorer wine but you have kept the good wine until now that means first of all nobody else really did know about the wine problem even he didn't know about it because he's just assuming they had it stashed somewhere right so he doesn't know all this was kind of secret and and John specifically lets you know that only the servants that filled those things with water knew what actually happened and the way Jesus sets this up is they just take some of the wine into this guy and nobody knows anything that happened there so he goes this is really good wine that's it that's the miracle right there so um, it was excellent wine excellent wine somebody's pointed out that you know Moses first miracle was turning water into blood Jesus first miracle was turning water into very fine excellent wine 
He's bringing good things. It's a grand, grand miracle. He's literally changing the law of physics and chemistry to produce instantly from water a wine that is perfected in its harvesting, crushing, fermentation, and maturing. Instantly, he's got incredible wine, wonderful wine. So in a moment, Jesus bypassed a very complex and time consuming and carefully timed process. That's a miracle folks. It's a pure miracle. It's an unquestioned miracle. But most of the people there didn't really know about it. Or if it was noised about it was from the servants who aren't very important anyway. Right? So um, what? Oh, Oh come on. So it's not that obvious. So notice in verse 9 how John emphasizes that the only people knew were servants. That's important. And the reason for having the feast master compliment the wine's quality is that he had no knowledge of where it came from. Ah, you've been saving the best for last. Now in verse 11 we have John's very informative comment on this whole thing here. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So this is how we know this was Jesus' first miracle. John calls it the beginning of signs. So for John it's signs, for Paul it's miracles. This is the first miracle. And indeed it was a manifestation of his glory, his kindness, his graciousness, and his power. Incredible power. Power to literally change the laws of physics. It's a staggering miracle and it's something that only God could do. And John tells us how this experience impacted the new disciples. It says the disciples believed in him. Now they've only been with him a few days. So this is pretty amazing what's what's happening here. They're following Jesus because John the Baptist pointed him out. This is the Lamb of God, right? Who takes away the sin of the world. They had faith in Jesus already based on their confidence in John. But this And that one little miracle at the end of chapter 1 where Nathanael's saying to Jesus, Rabbi, you're the son of God, you're the king of Israel because Jesus knew where he was sitting under a fig tree, right? But he already believed when he got there, they all did, they believed in something meaningful about Jesus, but now this belief thing is going to go off the scale, right? This sign, this faith, their their faith is going to grow much deeper. This is somebody amazing I mean amazing so this is their first miracle experience in their lives as well right and who would have expected so Jesus told Nathaniel in verse 50 of chapter 1 you will see greater things than these and they've already started at a wedding just a couple of days later so it's a true miracle just three days later and that's just the beginning they're going to learn a lot more about Jesus over time the disciples much more about him and they'll be doing miracles themselves as part of his ministry and they're proclaiming the kingdom. So John has more signs to share. That's just the first one. Remember there's seven in the gospel. And the next section, Jesus who was still in the very earliest stages of his ministry goes right for the great temple, the heart of Israel's faith. And he's going to do something there. And John doesn't identify any signs that Jesus does there. Although he'll mention that he did some signs there. But it doesn't talk about them. But Jesus does promise to the shocked and offended religious leaders of Israel. He promises them a sign that will shake the world forever and change the world. So that's what we'll look at in two weeks. Be here next week for brother Mike. He's going to talk about communion. And in two weeks we'll talk about Jesus in the temple for the first time. Let's pray. Lord what a joy you brought to a troubled family that day in Cana. Such a simple problem. But how you blessed them and showed compassion on them. They had no idea that day how great a blessing you were going to bring to the entire world. You took our sin away. Having carried our burden in your own body. And paid the penalty due to us. That is the greatest miracle. Your love so great that it led to the highest form of self-sacrifice of giving for an unworthy people like us. So we see your glory in many, many ways. And may we never lose sight of the greatest glory, which is your sacrifice for us. We pray this in your name. Amen.